Today is November the 4th, 2019. My name is Tanya Pincham. I'm in the Angie DeBow room on the OSU campus to speak with Val Castor. And we're going to learn a little bit about his background and then get into his work. He is a, stor a senior storm tracker for News 9 in Oklahoma City. Been doing this since 1991. So thank you for coming today. My pleasure. Let's begin with learning a little bit about you. When and where were you born? Okay, I was born in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, in 1961 and um, do you want to know my childhood now or you can okay tell me a little bit about your parents okay um, my parents uh, Jim and Joyce Castor and uh, they they were also Okies I guess you could say um, they're from Oklahoma both of them from around central Oklahoma Oklahoma City area uh, I think my dad grew up in Moore and my mom grew up in Midwest City so um, we're, we're all Okies around our family, okay. nothing but Oklahoma. Um, so my dad, uh, he came from an oil field background. Uh, his father spent his whole life working in the oil field. My dad worked in the oil field somewhat, and then he went to the Air Force, and then he started uh, a manufacturer's representative business uh, that he still runs today. And my mom grew up in Midwest City, and um, she is, uh, she was a, you could say a basketball star for, in high school. She made the all city team in Oklahoma City. So there's some athletics in the background right there, but um, good parents, um, you know, they took us to church just about every Sunday and um, it would led a pretty normal life growing up. Well, how did they meet since they were from two different towns? Do you know? I think they met at the local Sonic drive-in somewhere <laughs> either in Midwest City or more or somewhere over there like that when they were in high school okay so I think that's where they met and do you have siblings do do I have siblings yes I've got uh, two brothers uh, one is Vaughn Castor and uh, he's three years younger than me and he lives in Muskogee right now and he also is a storm tracker for Channel 6 in Tulsa and so I have another brother uh, named John Castor, and he is 10 years younger than me, and he lives in Fort Worth. Went down there on a baseball scholarship to TCU and ended up meeting a girl and got married and stayed down there. Funny how that works, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Did your younger brother get interested in storm tracking because of you? Uh, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, we... You know, after, I mean, I wouldn't say we grew up chasing storms because when we were growing up, I mean, that was pretty much unheard of. Nobody really chased storms. But uh, somewhere in our college years, he started chasing with me, and that's kind of how he learned. Now, before we get to college, then, where did you go to high school? Nathan Hale High School in Tulsa. From Ardmore to Tulsa, then? Yeah. Okay. We moved uh, from Ardmore to Tulsa when I was in, I'm going to say, first or second grade. And then um, that's pretty much where I grew up after that. Okay. Graduated from high school what year? 1980. And did you have a favorite subject while you were in high school? Uh, sports. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't really say I had a favorite subject. Um, favorite teacher then? Um, not the coach. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, no, not really. I mean, high school, I, I wasn't. I didn't study very much, and, and I was just ready to, you know, uh, get out, and I, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think about that. No one's ever asked me that question before. I always want to know about tornadoes and stuff. But, yeah, in, in high school, I mean, I was pretty much an average student, I guess you could say. I wasn't real motivated, you know, for academics and uh, when I got out of high school, I didn't. I knew I loved weather. I knew I loved, um, but uh, all of my friends were going to OSU, so that's where I went. Okay. That's so. my next question. How how did you come to be at OSU? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, out of high school, actually, um, I worked a part time job um, after I graduated from high school, and I went to Tulsa Junior College for two years. Okay. And got a lot of credits out of the way that way, and uh, I, you know, at that point in my life, I, I knew 
I loved weather, but I really didn't, you know, know, or maybe I just wasn't educated enough to know what could be done in weather, or maybe, maybe I thought meteorology, you know, that's, uh, you know, that requires too much math and science, and all my friends in Tulsa were, were going to OSU, and so I just decided to go there and took business courses. Okay. So my major started out at OSU in business management. So that's what I majored in to start with because I really didn't know what I wanted to do at that point, except you know, I love weather. I just didn't know there were any careers involved in weather at that point. So it didn't take me too long to realize that in order to do good in something, you kind of have to have an interest in it or like it. And so um, when I started getting into some of the harder business courses, you know, at OSU, like some of the, um, I don't know, we had to take all kinds of stuff, business, I can't even remember what some of those are, but I, my grade started suffering, you know, because of it. And so I figured out that I'd better get into something that I really like, because I hated accounting, you know, and that's one of the classes I wasn't doing so good in, and I didn't like crunching all those numbers. I was pretty good at math. You know, I, I could do math just fine, but um, I didn't like accounting at all. So I figured out that I better get, you know, into something that, that really interests me. And so, um, so I started checking into it, and OSU did not offer a meteorology program, but they did offer a geography program, which was pretty close, you know, as close as I could find at OSU. And so I started taking some geography courses, and I liked it. Uh, one of those courses was physical geography with Dr. Stadler. I got to meet him the other day again after 30 years, by the way. But um, so my grades started going up, and I liked physical geography. I liked that. I mean, I was interested in it. I was doing well in it, and so uh, I transferred my major from business to geography. And then somewhere along the way, in the maturing process, I was getting a little older, a little bit more mature, and I started thinking, you know what? Um, you know, I, I really love meteorology. I might as well go ahead and try to give it a shot. So I started looking around for schools that offered a meteorology degree. And so um, the, the only one in the state is o, OU. So anyway, I went down there to look at things and check out their program and uh, decided that um, when I graduated, I was close to graduating here in geography, that, uh, that I would just go down there and transfer my credits to transfer down to meteorology. So I finished up my geography degree at OSU, and I started in, you know, while I was getting the required courses out of the way, I started taking some, some of the harder math courses that would transfer to OU and count towards the meteorology degree. And uh, when I got there, I already had a significant amount of credits, okay. you know, and uh, so that's how I went from there to there. And you finished from OU, OSU in what year? 1986. 86, was that OU? Right. 1991, yeah. Did and you... I actually took a year off or a year or two off during that time to work and then went back into it. Did you have Dr. Crawford at OU? Can you talk I about did. Him? He was my advisor, as a matter of fact. You know him? I interviewed him right before he passed away. Okay. For part of his, his role in the mezzanine. Yep. Created the mezzanine. Yeah, he was very instrumental in that, yeah. yeah. Great guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know Dr. Stadler, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's back up then. In high school, you said you sports were your, were you good at, were you in basketball, or baseball, what? You know, uh, baseball was my main sport. Okay. I played, you know, baseball. Uh, I played a little bit of football in junior high and a little bit of basketball in junior high, but, uh, you know, as time went on, everybody outgrew me, and so then I settled on baseball, and I really like baseball. Okay. So when you came to OSU, did you attend games? Were you involved in any extra kind of things like that? Uh, I mean, a little bit. I mean, you know, I wasn't, um, I attended more football games than anything. I mean, that's the most exciting thing, right? <laughs> Basketball can be, but yeah. Basketball, I went to a few basketball games and went to one or two baseball games, but uh, but football, you know, I went to more. Did you live on campus? I lived on campus the first year. I stayed in Kerr Drummond dorms. Okay. And then after that, I lived off campus. They're still standing, but they're on the chopping block. 
Are they? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to see your I can't own, tell you all the stories that went on there. But. <laughs> if you want to see your old room, you better check it out in, okay. the, next, in the next year or so. Might on. just do that. Come down. <laughs> so, and did you have a favorite spot when you were on campus? <sighs> a favorite spot? I don't... I mean... Um, I can tell you I spent time in the library studying, and that was probably my least, I hate to say it, that's probably my least favorite spot. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, Boomer Lake was always fun. That's a good spot, you know. Um, so, I don't know, that's a good question. Spend much time in the student union? Uh, a little bit of time in the student union. Was the bowling alley still in that building when you were here? I, wait a minute, I do have your answer right now. Okay. My favorite spot when I was going to school here was not on campus. It was at the golf course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of time playing golf at it, at it Lakeside. Lakeside. Yeah. Carson Creek wasn't. Carson Creek back, back, back. was not even in existence back then. It would have been too rich for my blood anyway. Yeah. yeah all of us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your handicap? Or was it then? Um, you know, I was probably back then. I was probably I wasn't that good. Um, probably a 10 or so, you know, something something around there. Okay. And did you work while you were on, on campus um, as a student? You know, I, I went home for the summers and worked. Okay. I didn't work uh, when I was up here. I take that back. I had one or two odd jobs, I believe, when I was here. But uh, I would go home during the summers and work, you know, construction or something or at my dad's warehouse. Earn some spending money. <clears throat> yeah, earn some spending. money. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And those were the days where you registered, sent in line with, over in the registrar's office instead of doing it on online for classes. You know, all I remember about that is long lines. Yeah. Okay. Bursar's yeah. office, right? Yep. Long lines. It was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, and Theta Pond, of course, was was still as pretty as it is today. I would think. Ex yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Nice place. Okay, so we're catching up to 1991. You graduate from OU. Okay. It's hard to say that sometimes. I know. <laughs> and, but I live in Stillwater now, so. Tell, so after you graduated from there, take us through. What, what was your first job after, after earning your degree from there? So, um, you know, there's a story involved in that. Okay. I mean, as there is everything. But uh, my first job when I graduated was working with Channel 9. Uh, they hired me right after I graduated, but you know, there, there's more to it than that. So when I was a senior at OU, um, I, I had learned how to, to chase basically with some of the other students that were in my class. I mean, we would get together and go out and, and learn and just go chase storms. It was kind of a pastime there for meteorology students to chase storms. So the first couple times I went out, I went out with a couple of the older, more experienced uh, students that already knew how to chase storms, but um, basically we were pretty much self-taught. By the way, I would not recommend this at home, okay? <laughs> but um, so that's how we kind of learned how to chase. So uh, in the spring of 1991, uh, one day just on a whim, I called Channel 9. Uh, to see if they needed anybody to chase for them, okay? Because, you know, I, I watched, watched them and I, I started you know, thinking, man, they could do better than this, you know? We could, I could get more tornado video than what they seem to be getting. So I just called them up and, uh, and I did not expect to talk to anybody in the weather center. I called the main number at the switchboard and um, said, you know what, I'm a college student here at OU, and I was wanting to talk to somebody in the weather department about chasing storms. And so she patched me right through to the weather department. And so the person that answered the phone, uh, his name was Alan Mitchell. I don't know if anybody remembers him or not, but uh, he was the, the weekend meteorologist at Channel 9 at that point. Gary England was the, the head chief meteorologist there. But Alan was the second in charge meteorologist. And so Alan, he was an ex-Air Force weather officer. That's where he got his weather training. Um, kind of, you know, a little gruff, you know, a little loud, that kind of 
And so um, when he got on the phone, I'm thinking, oh man, I'm talking to Alan Mitchell here. But um, I remember what he said when I talked to him. I, I told him, I said, I said, you know, I'm a student at OU and, and I, I'm getting pretty good at chasing storms. And I was wondering if you guys needed anybody to chase storms you know, for you. And then he yelled at Gary, he said, hey Gary, we got this kid on the phone from OU that thinks he can chase storms. I'm like, oh brother, what did I get into, you know? And Alan, he said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, if you want to come up here to the station, um, we will um, we'll lend you a cell phone. And then when you go out chasing, you can call us to get radar information about where the storms are. We'll let you know what the storms look like. And uh, in return, you can give us your video when you get it. Because I had a camera that I had borrowed from my dad. It was an old, I don't even know, like a Super 8, you know, camera, video camcorder um, that I was using. And so um, I said, okay. So I went up to the station and um, they gave me a, a, a phone. And see, back in those days, nobody had car phones. I mean, except for the rich people, you know. I'm a college student. I had nothing like that. But so what they gave me was one of those old Motorola bag phones, okay, where you just plug it into your cigarette lighter and talk on it. And but you know, it's pretty cool because I never had a way to communicate in the car before to anybody. So took the phone home and and uh, the first chase after that was on April 12th of 1991, and there was a couple of tornadoes that day, and we got video of one tornado that was uh, near Marshall, Oklahoma, which is, I don't know, 20 or 30 miles west of here. And so uh, I took the video back to Channel 9, and they were happy, you know, because the, the helicopter had been up there also, and they got some video of it too, but they had my video, but they used it on the air. And so uh, they were happy about it, and I actually got to meet Gary England that day. And so um, he uh, he said, well, you know what? I'm I'm pretty pleased with what you, you know the video that you got. I want to give you an autographed book. <laughs> so I got an autographed book from one of Gary's books. You know, but I I wasn't making any money chasing storms for him, but I didn't care. I mean, it was I was pumped up because I thought that was pretty cool. You know, chasing for Channel Nine. And so um, the next time that we went out was two weeks later, and that was April twenty sixth of nineteen ninety one. Now that was the day that there was a big outbreak of tornadoes that day, northern Oklahoma and southern Kansas. It was the same day, I don't know if you remember the video, the Under the Bridge video at Andover, Kansas, mm -hmm. near Wichita, where the reporters got up underneath the bridge and the tornado went right over them. They got some really incredible video there. But um, So that day, we were scheduled to have a test in our meteorological measurements class. It's a 4,000 level course, you know, one of the upper courses there that we needed to graduate. And there was only like 12 of us in there, but just about every one of us chased, you know, was wanting to go chase it. But three or four days ahead of that, you know, we could see the long range weather forecast that looked like it was gonna be a big chase day on that day. But we had a test at like two o'clock in the afternoon which was right in the middle of, you know, the chasing, the prime chasing. So we talked to our instructor, Dr. Fred Brock was his name, and asked him if we could get the test moved up to 10 in the morning so that we could get out there and you know, chase storms. And he agreed, mm -hmm. thankfully. So uh, I had the truck ready. I parked it out close so we could get out of class and just leave straight from school. So me and a friend of mine that chased with me, uh, we. After we were done with that test, we just took off and got in the truck and left. And ended up that um, we got video of three tornadoes that day. Uh, and they were near Enid, just east of Enid. It was an F3 that we got pretty close to and got good video of. Uh, the second one was a small, ropey uh, F0 that didn't last very long. But then right after that, a big one formed. And that's what's called the Red Rock Tornado. It was a mile wide F4 tornado that uh, formed and then crossed I-35 and then went on. It went near north of Red Rock, I think. But it was on the ground, gosh, I want to say at least 40 or 50 or 60 miles, a uh, big tornado. And so um, 
we got some good video that day. And needless to say, when we brought it back to the station, Gary was really happy with us then. Yeah. So happy he gave me a Channel 9 jacket. <laughs> but he did say, uh, we got to figure out a way to get you on here um, as, you know, to chase. Because they didn't have any storm trackers back then. All they did back in those days is they, uh, they sent out their reporters and their photographers to chase storms and they you know they're they're not no meteorological background or anything i'm some of them are probably pretty good at it but um that's what they did so anyway i was all set really planning on working for the national weather service when i got out as a, a forecaster um i was interning up there on the NOAA weather radio at the time talking on the weather radio you know now if you hear the weather radio my son has one uh, and he listens to it, but it's, uh, you know, it'll say something like, okay, at 5 p.m. in Stillwater, the temperature is 42 degrees, the dew point is 37, the relative humidity is 75%, and the winds from the south at 10 miles an hour gusting to 20, and the pressure is 29.95 and falling, you know, that kind of stuff. I was the one that said that, along with other, you know, other people that worked there too, but we used to have to do warnings also live sometimes, warnings on the weather radio. So that's what I was doing at the time. So I was, you know, planning on being a forecaster at the National Weather Service, but, um, you know, this kind of intrigued me and it was a whole lot more fun, you know. And so Gary decided he, he could, he's gonna try to figure out a way to get me on there. So I started out, there was an opening and he, and he knew that management would never go for hiring someone strictly for chasing storms. So what they did is they had an opening for a floor camera operator to take video of the news, to shoot the news, the four, five, six, 10 o'clock news. So that's what I did. That's where I started out. That's how I started out at their channel nine. And so uh, over the years, they've worked me into storm, being a storm tracker. Matter of fact, as soon as I got up there, they, they put me you know, in a conference room in front of a bunch of all the people at the station to have me train them on how to chase storms. So, and then they had me going out with every one of the photographers and the reporters on a rotating basis uh, to kind of give them experience on how to chase. So I was the first uh, storm chaser that Channel 9 hired back then. And then over the years, we've kind of added our numbers and now we have seven two-man teams that go out and chase storms. And it can keep them busy for an entire year? Uh, pretty much. I mean, not it, it's a part. It's part time work, okay. you know, okay. for the most part. Some of us chase more than others, but um, you know, in the in the wintertime, we go out and cover blizzards. And it's snow. not just tornadoes or bad weather. It's fires and right other things, I guess. Yeah, in in the early days, it was just storms and tornadoes that we went out. But we're chasing a lot more now than, than we used to. We're covering fires, like you said, and ice storms and flooding and uh, blizzards and that kind of stuff. Do you still have your jacket? I do, somewhere. I've and got that it. Book. I think I've got the book too, yes. And did you pass the test? Uh, yes, and I graduated even. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> and did you, did, at that point, did you have good insurance on your truck when you were just starting out doing this sort of thing? Yeah, I had insurance. <laughs> um, you know, that's, when I go speak at schools and events and stuff like that, uh, especially if I'm talking to adults, that's the one question they'll ask me. How do you get insurance? And, um, you know, it's really not as hard as, as most people think, but, um, and, and they, they know what I do, you know, but uh, anyway, I've got insurance. Well, in the early days, you probably had a, an older car you were chasing with anyway. Yeah, I mean, college days. I'll, I'll tell you, I never buy a new car to chase. I'll always buy one that's a few years old at least, you know, and uh, because by the time I get done with it, it's not going to be worth that much. And was it was it fun working with Gary? Yeah, Gary's Gary's a fun guy to work for. I mean, uh, he's I started out. He was working there when I started out. He retired in uh, I believe it was 2013, and so now we have David Payne. Uh, he's our chief meteorologist now, and and he's fun to work for too. He's a He's a good boss to have. One of, uh, was Gary, I guess it would say, get me, get me Val on the get, get, yep. get, get Val on the get her. 
What's the Gettner? <laughs> That's another question that always comes up. You know, some people think that on Gettner was my last name. Uh-huh. Get Val on Gettner. Yeah. I've had people say that. Is your last name on Gettner? No, it's Castor. But the Gettner is the name of a device or a machine that allows our phone conversation to be put on the air. Okay. So it's the Gettner machine and, you know, put him on the Gettner and do. But now, I mean, a few years ago, we phased out the Gettner and brought in something else. I think it's the Telos is what it's called, but they still say get him on Gettner. What else has changed in those 28 years from technology-wise? From you know, there's, there's probably the main thing uh, that has changed that, that we like the most is the ability to stream video from where we're at. Because in the early days, you know, we had no way of all, at all to get our video back live. No way. Um, what we'd have to do is uh, record the video and then we have to go meet the satellite truck somewhere and we would take it to the satellite truck before 10 o'clock and he would beam it up to satellite and beam it back to the station and that's how they would get our video back. Uh, or if, if we were close enough to the station we would bring the, the video in and make sure we got it back before 10 o'clock when the news comes on. So the next step after that was um, we had a device that would send a picture, right? They would say, send me a pic, and we'd, we'd send them a pic. Just hit a button, and the picture that we were showing right at that moment would get transferred back over um, you know, a modem, basically, a slow connection, really, really slow connection. And so from that point on, we, we uh, evolved into like a, a limited clip of, of, of video getting sent back because it just took forever because all the connections were slow back then. Uh, but now we've got something called the DeGiro. It's a, it's, it's a company that makes this device. And what they do is, I believe it's eight, um, eight internet connections simultaneously okay there's 10 or 11 antennas on top of my truck and there's eight cell phone connections that are all that they're going on at the same time and those all basically combine to produce uh, a channel to to funnel all of our video through our hd video and so um now we get live video no matter where you are no pretty much no matter where we are now there's some places that the bad cell phone connection, but we've got three different carriers. I think we've, we've got AT&T and Sprint and Verizon. And so if one of those drops off, we still have the other two that's on. And so, I mean, it's pretty much amazing. That technology right there it has caused us to even phase out our satellite truck. Half a million dollar truck, not in use anymore. And, and all television stations are doing that too. We're spending that on gas. <laughs> now we're spending on gas. That's right. We've always been spending on gas, but, um, but yeah, that technology right there. I mean, they even have um, that that you can wear as a backpack. You can carry a camera and wear that on your back, and you can walk around. And you can get video out from pretty much wherever you go. Live video. That's just amazing, isn't it? It is. A long way from when you were using your dad's dad's video uh, camera. And you know, I back then when we were chasing on our own, uh, the only thing we had was a scanner, a handheld scanner. We'd have to tune it in. I could get the NOAA weather radio if I was close enough to a town, right? Or we could get like civil defense spotters that were out reporting, and those were few and far between also. So most of the time we had zero way to communicate or hear from anybody about what was going on. So in those days, it kind of made me a better chaser than I am today because we would have to make a really good forecast before we left, all right? Uh, Make a really good forecast to get us in the right area where we thought storms were going to go up because we would have to rely on line of sight to see storms. So, you know, now, since we have radar in our truck and internet and we can get anything quick like that, um, if we drive out to Woodward, let's say, and all of a sudden the area shifts to southwest Oklahoma, say down around Altus, now we can see that ahead of time and we can be there 
or if we see storms on satellites start to go up down there, we can get there in time, most of the time, you know, to get to the storm. But in the old days, you know, if we chose Woodward and storms started going up in Altus, we would have to visually see them if the visibility was good enough, and most of the time it's not. We'd have to see them to be able to head that direction. Uh, and we see a lot more tornadoes today than we did back then because of that. Well, in general, do you think the weather has changed? Weather patterns have changed that much? In no, I don't think the weather's really changed that much. I mean, this yeah, technology's it, helped you find it more. Technology has helped us find it more. Matter of fact, I think there's just as many tornadoes back then, even though if you go back and look at statistics, and uh, statistics will show that there's more tornadoes being reported today than there was 50 or 60 years ago. But the reason that is, is because now we have so many people with cell phones and so many people with, you can report tornadoes, you can take video of them, we got better radar coverage, we got television stations sending people out. Back then, there was a lot of tornadoes that happened that never ever got reported, especially at night. Well, when you were out first, first chasing this, would you call home and say, Mom, Dad, guess what, I'm, what, guess what I did today? When I got back, that's right. It, when you got back, not, <laughs> not before you went, huh? Well, <laughs> I, maybe, I can't remember, but my mom was always supportive about that. She was, you know, I imagine she was nervous. I imagine it made her nervous, but she was real supportive. She I said, Mom, I saw my first tornado today. Oh, great, fantastic, way to go, you know. Uh, how far were you from it? <laughs> um, the first one, I mean, we were probably three miles away from it, you know, which, which is pretty far, really. For that goes and so um, today we get a whole lot closer than that just go look at my uh, at my semi video in southwest Kansas from this year you know anybody that's, that's listening right now go on our YouTube channel and look at the uh, semi gets knocked over video and we you'll see how close we get do you by now do you have a sense of how close you can get without crossing that yeah, I and mean, that, that's something I was just explaining to uh, somebody the other day, a young chaser, I think it was. But, um, you know, back in those days, when I told you about the F4, the cross I-35. So um, I thought I was super, super close to it. Went back, you know, and found our location. We we're probably a mile and a half, you know, from that tornado. But we, it looked really, really close. Now I would have probably been a quarter of a mile from it. So over the years, I've kind of, you know, and you can only do this through experience, but over the years, we've, we know, um, you know, where we can push our limits and where we can't. So each time we go out, it, it, we learn a lot from that. And each year, you know, we, we learn how close we can push the limit, as you were talking about a while ago. So you can only really do that through experience because you don't want to mess up have you ever guessed wrong? Yeah, plenty of times. Had to put it in reverse and... Yep, um, on the, uh, the El Reno tornado day in 2013, there was a large tornado. Matter of fact, it was 2.6 miles wide at its widest. It was a world record as far as the width goes. Even though they only officially had it rated as an F3, it was an F5, I'm here to tell you. It was an F5 tornado. Um, it just, they, they, I guess they couldn't find F5 damage because there wasn't a lot to hit out there. Mm -hmm. But um, that was the largest tornado in the world that's ever, ever recorded. Um, largest tornado I've ever seen, obviously. But we got, when we first pulled up on that tornado, it was growing in size. And we were probably a quarter of a mile from multiple vortex tornado forming in a field. And as we sat there and watched it, um, the, the edge of the wall cloud, or the lip of the wall cloud basically, was just ahead of us, almost overhead of us, and uh, it started expanding westward towards us. We were looking east at it, and it started coming over us, and I could see that thing just ripping to the south, 100 miles an hour, just spinning like that. At the same time, we had west winds blowing from, from our backs into the tornado, probably 80 miles an hour, just rocking the truck. And this thing was expanding backwards and it was growing is what was happening. So we put it in reverse and packed up, <laughs> gave it a little bit of room. And I'm, I'm glad we did 
because um, unfortunately that was a deadly tornado for storm chasers. I think there were four storm chasers that lost their life that day in that tornado because it was much bigger than they thought and uh, it, it was pretty deceptive how big it was. How does the community respond to something like that, the storm, the storm chaser community respond? Um, you know, obviously, you know, there's sympathy, you know, and for that, but other than that, I, you know, that's pretty much it. You just learn and try not to do the same? You learn and, you know, hopefully you learn and try not to get um, too crazy or out of control with it. And, you know, see that, hey, this really can't happen because it's, I don't think there's ever been a storm chaser die in a tornado until this day. Yeah, I mean, there's there's been some wrecks and, you know, problems like that, but I don't think there's ever been a, a tornado chaser that's been out that's actually, you know, been chasing and got killed in a tornado until that day. So that kind of made everybody sit up and realize, hey, you know, this can't happen, you know. And, and I think that there's even, I mean, I know of a few people that kind of got rattled about that too that day and, and have either dropped out of it altogether or that vastly changed the way they chase. Well, since we're talking a little bit about the community of storm chasers, is there a code or any, I don't know, special group or association or do uh, you communicate between each other or more competitive or <clears throat> what? You know, there's, there's basically two different groups of storm chasers. One is, um, is the people that do it on their own. Uh, and then there's us, which are the media chasers. So, there, you know, there's a number of media chasers. There's far more chasers out there that do it on their own, uh, you know. And, and there, of course, there's forums and blogs and stuff like that that you can get on. And, um, but, yeah, they're, they're, they're a community, I guess you could say. In, in your mind, is there a difference between chasers and trackers? Um, just the name. I mean, we're called Storm Trackers. That's just our name, you know, our channel line name, Storm. But there is a difference between Storm Chasers and Storm Spotters. Okay. Because uh, the civil defense and local uh, emergency management uh, facilities, you know, different counties, they have spotters that go out and they report back to them. And what a spotter will do is find a location and stay there and watch the storm. What a chaser does though is we actively pursue the storm. We don't just go stay in one spot. We'll follow it and chase after it. Okay. When you get up in the morning getting ready to do this sort of thing, or do you have a a routine of sorts? Um, you know, I I would say that uh, you know, I'm trying to balance um, working and also taking care of kids you know, and getting things done that need to get done personally, right? Mm -hmm. With also watching the weather. So as far as uh, the weather is concerned, when I wake up, I will, um, I will, you know, open up the weather maps, get on the computer and start looking at, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what the short range forecasts call for that day. And there, there's uh, several different computer models that we use. One of them is the HRRR, which stands for um, High Resolution Rapid Refresh Model. And so it goes out every hour. It'll, it'll do a new forecast every hour. And we look at that pretty extensively. And there's another one that we look at. And there's some medium range forecast models also. But we'll definitely, in the morning, we'll be just pouring over the weather maps, looking at it, trying to figure out where we go. Because it's real important to get yourself in the right spot when you first go out there. Because, you know, like I said, if you're in Woodward and stuff starts going up in Altus, then you're already behind. Yeah. And then in, in the interim, do you, if you're waiting, if you're sitting to wait for it to develop, do you, how do you spend your, your time if you're just waiting? Out there, you mean? Yeah, out there. Still looking at weather maps. Just looking, okay. Yeah, I mean, we'll sit there and we have everything in the truck that we got at home now because we got, you know, internet, you can get anything you want. And it's not paper maps these it's days. It's not paper, and we used to use paper maps, and that's another technology thing that has really helped us out. We have GPS mapping software, 
And in the past, I mean, we had paper maps all over the truck. Every time we drilled down the window, they'd fly everywhere. You know, we even had a, a county road atlas of all 77 counties that we would open up and look at. A big book about that big, you know, with all the counties in it to see where the dirt roads were and stuff like that. We don't even need that stuff now. Well, you probably know where most of them are anyway by now. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of them out there. I don't know most of them, but you know, yeah, there's a lot of them out there. Is there a part of the state that you haven't had to visit very often? Yeah, I would say far eastern or southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, probably far southeast Oklahoma is our least um, go-to area. Number one, it's it's out of the Channel Line viewing area. Um, number two, there's really rough terrain down there hills and trees and it's hard to see tornadoes and hard to chase tornadoes and they're usually moving away from us into arkansas mm -hmm. at that point so but we have been down there before we've been in all the counties every, every one of them but been in eastern and southeast is our least favorite you know place to go chase because it's just hard to chase well from a practical standpoint you prepare for food and restroom breaks and that sort of thing um, yeah, I mean, you can't, uh, you just got to wing it when you're out there. I mean, okay. you can't prepare for everything, but we try to bring food and snacks with us and stuff like that in case we don't get to eat. Because there's sometimes, as soon as we leave, we're chasing and we might not be done until midnight, you know, so we just got to eat or drink what we have, you know, or maybe a quick, uh, at a gas station. Quick trip. Yeah. Quick trip. How many days, like a year, do you, would you be in that oper operation, that mode, that mode of operation? How are May and October? Well, I know you sure. know, April, May, and June are the three biggest months okay. of the year for tornadoes. Uh, but then again, we have kind of a secondary season in the fall, and October is probably the big month for that. Uh, some years we don't have hardly anything in the fall, and some years we'll. We might have an outbreak. Um, so, you know, as far as numbers of days that we're out actually chasing tornadoes, I haven't really looked, but I'm going to say maybe 50 or 60, something like that. Okay. Now we might as well ask the question about mileage per year. Since we're yeah, I mean, we, we put, up, put on, I'm going to say between 45 and 50,000 miles per year chasing storms. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about the truck. Okay. How has it changed over the over the years? Um, back in uh, back in the old days, I used to chase in a half ton gas truck. Okay, and that's what I chased in. I think one year I tried a, a Tahoe and decided it was too top heavy and not stable enough. Actually, got that thing destroyed by hail when you when I took it out. To I mean, literally destroyed. We got into a hailstorm south of the Red River south of Lawton, and uh, the, the hail was four inches in diameter, and it broke pretty much every window in the truck and everything, it totaled it. So we, we uh, I had to, basically, I couldn't see. The windshield was so shattered, little pieces of glass were coming in on us. We had a dozen little cuts in our arms, you know, from all the glass that was coming in, the little tiny little shards of glass. And it was so, that the windshield was so beat up that I couldn't see to drive out of. So I stopped. And when I stopped, the wind was blowing and it started knocking out the back windows and the side windows and all that. But So I, had, I took a, a tire tool and knocked a hole in the windshield in front of my face. I know this is probably not legal to do, but I should have just called the tow truck, but I was 300 miles from home. Knocked a hole about that big in front of me so that I could see. And that's how I drove home, with a hole in my windshield. Yeah. Do you like you're on a motorcycle, I guess? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay until it started raining. So then you learned to, now do you wear long sleeves? No. No. <laughs> no. No, just try to stay out of the hail. Okay. And then bring us up your improvements in your truck through, through the years. So, um, I want to say... Uh, maybe six or seven years ago, I discovered the diesel pickup, mm -hmm. which was a, a big improvement over the gas trucks. And the reason that is, is number one, it's a heavier truck and it, it seems to do better in, in the wind, okay? The wind doesn't push us around as much, okay? 
Number two, the heaviness of the truck also, it doesn't hydroplane as much, right? Because it's, it's heavier and it keeps it on the ground. And if you think about it, driving, probably our most dangerous part of our driving is in heavy rain because you know you got a layer of water on the ground and hydroplane people run off the road from hydroplaning so also the diesel pickup i mean we usually i usually lift my truck a little a little bit to get it up off the ground so that we can if we get off road and stuff like that we don't get stuck and uh, also if there's flooding and stuff like that but our gas truck lifted just doesn't have the torque and the mileage goes way down so in a gas truck you know, with it lifted like that, I was getting chasing, I was getting 10 or 11 miles a gallon. So with my diesel, you can lift the diesel all day long and it still gets good gas mileage, still has plenty of power to pull it. And I'm probably getting 15 miles a gallon. And the diesels have bigger gas tanks on them. So I probably got about 200 miles to a tank in the gas truck and now I'm getting 400 to 450 you know, so I can fill up right before we start chasing and never have to fill up again mm. the rest of the day. Plus that's extra weight too, I guess. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. And then the last thing obviously is, is the torque or the power that the diesel has. Uh, it, uh, and, and if, you know, if you have never been out there and you get, you have to drive against the wind, um, it really lugs down a gas vehicle pretty good driving against a 40 or 50 mile an hour wind. But the diesel just didn't really seem to affect it too much. And I noticed it had a roll bar or a roll cage. It's it's got uh, we call that a headache rack. I mean, you could call it a roll bar or whatever you want, but it it houses a lot of equipment okay. on it. So I've got um, a camera on the top. That's uh, uh, also a night vision camera. Um, so it's on top of the vehicle, gets higher up. We can see over the weeds and the ditch and trees and stuff like that. And we can also turn it any direction while we're driving. And it also goes into night mode whenever uh, at night, lets us see quite a bit better after dark. So that's one thing on the truck right there. There's also an anemometer that we've been using this year that tells us the wind speed. Um, and then, uh, you know, those are probably the two main things you can visually see from the outside. Okay, and it it's, uh, has a, a front and a back seat. I mean, it has. With a yes. king cab or whatever they call them. It's a crew cab. Okay. Right. So it's got plenty of room for people. Do you take ride alongs? Are you are you You know, we used to be able to take ride alongs until insurance got involved and yeah. and now we're not supposed to do it. Um, sometimes if if there's we'll have like maybe a film crew uh, that's doing a documentary that they'll ride with us. Uh, like from England or somewhere like that. I mean, that's happened quite a bit. Uh, they do documentaries for National Geographic or Discovery Channel or stuff like that. They'll come with us and mm -hmm. ride in the back and have their cameras and all that. That's pretty neat too. Yeah, yeah. pretty cool. And then if, if someone needs help, do you offer, you know, get them to safety, that type of thing, if you're out in the midst of things? Yeah, I mean, um, there's been a couple times where we've actually helped people out. One of them was uh, in a wildfire in Northwest Oklahoma, a really bad wildfire day. Uh, winds were gusting close to 60 miles an hour. Flames were moving fast. There was a road grader, a guy driving a road grader that um, was trying to plow a fire line in a ditch. And the ditch got too steep for him and he couldn't get out and he kept trying to get out and he was stuck and so we just happened to be there and so at the very last minute the flames were coming fast so we drove right up to the right up to him he jumped out got in the truck and we took off as flames were coming over the hood of my truck I mean and that's another thing we have on YouTube if somebody wants to go check it out it's pretty dramatic mm -hmm. so um, and his road grader was completely engulfed when we left um, he left his hat in there and it melted in the cab so that's how hot it got inside that thing but there's been also um, like a flood will pull people out of cars and flood and put them in the truck because they're stalled out and water might be rising and you know stuff like that what's the the oddest thing you've seen during all of this huh. or unique 
I don't know if I have to work out word would be, but unexpected. There's a lot of unexpected things. Uh, we were out chasing somewhere in southwest Oklahoma, and this crazy man in a pickup, old man, drove up. And uh, it was me and my wife were there, and then Bobby and his wife, he just started chasing with us. We're out there, and we were watching the clouds, and this old man drove up, and he said, come here a minute. And he's wanting to ask what was going on, and, and so he, I don't know how he got there, but he wasn't wearing anything but his underwear driving in a truck. I'm like, okay, you can go now. That was really weird. <laughs> there was a, I want to say there's a, I'm trying to remember all the weird, goofy things that have happened when we were out. There's a lot, but um, I mean, oh, there's another time too. So we were driving west on Highway 51 before the storms even started. Okay. And we were west of Hennessy between Hennessy and O'Keene. And then we lived in Stillwater at the time, and you know, we, we take Highway 51 west a lot. So um, I'm driving west, you know, no storms. We're, we're going out there, it might be one, or two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, probably headed towards Sealing or Woodward. And so I look at my rearview mirror, and this is car way, way back there, and then I look up again, and he's a lot closer, so he's obviously going really fast. And so it didn't take him long to zoom around us okay i mean he's probably going 120 miles an hour like, what's going on with that and then i look back again and i see these flashing lights back there also coming fast and he zoomed around us and it was a chase uh this car was being chased okay so obviously we try to follow him you know and let's see what's going on here so we sped up and tried they were going so fast we couldn't really catch up to him but Two miles east of O'Keen, there was a, a flat wheat field. Okay, so the guy in the car um, took out and tried to drive across this wheat field, and he didn't get but about a quarter of a mile, maybe 300 yards, let's say, and he, he bogged down and got stuck. So he gets out. So there's this shirtless guy with long hair out of this car just running across this field, and this police tried to pull out in the field also. And we're videoing all of this when it's going on. Back at Channel Line, hey, look what we got, you know? And, and so uh, so this muscle-up guy, you know, just running across this field and and the police, I think it was a local Hennessy police, but it was a woman, okay? Um, she got kind of stuck in the field too and the, a ways behind the other car. So she jumps out with her hand on her gun trying to chase this guy, but never was going to catch him, you know. So we videoed that, and the guy got away, um, and we just he disappeared across this wheat field. So we start driving all around the perimeter, and all these other people start showing up, all these undercover cops and stuff like that. So what had happened was, is he had stolen a car in Hennessy or somewhere and uh, crossed the county lines, and they are chasing him, and he ended up hiding in, a, in an abandoned barn, and they took the police dogs out there and finally found him. That's kind of weird. And your second career is going to be writing stories. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we have to cover new stories too. Yeah. yeah, if we just happen to be in the area. Happen to be there. Yeah. Right. So since you mentioned your wife was your is your partner sometimes, let's let's go back and talk about how how that came to be. Okay. So um, she's my partner all the time now. So, I mean, yeah, she's, uh, she goes with me. And so, um, I'm trying to remember uh, what year. This was in the late 90s. I had already been chasing at Channel 9 for a while, but she was going to school up at OSU, and she was in the engineering program, and she was looking for a, a project for her senior, senior project. And she was interested in storm chasing. As a matter of fact, she did some storm chasing on her own that year, you know, out around this area, I guess it was. But so she called Channel 9 looking for, uh, you know, some sort of a project to do. And so they referred her to me. And that's how we met. I guess I ended up becoming a project. <laughs> but that's how we met. And we, she was interested in storm chasing and, um, 
you know, we started, you know, going out and then eventually she, and eventually I kicked out my old partner and had her come in with me. Okay. Well, then how do you manage the, the, after you've got six children mm -hmm. and you both go out doing this, what's happening at, at home with the, with the young We got a long list of babysitters. Oh, that's, yeah. That can be there at a moment's notice or? Yeah, that's the plan. Mm -hmm. Not Monday, if it happens Monday, it's this person, Tuesday, it's this person. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, that's probably the hardest part about chasing is finding babies. And, it's in, and it, the, risk, the risk factor of this involved with, with when you have little ones at, at home, too, is there days when you think, well, it's just not. You mean the risk factor to us or to them? To, to you guys. Oh, um, we'll go out no matter what on any day. We have a storm shelter at home that the kids can go in. Okay. Uh, that gives us peace of mind. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, and they've had to use it before too. Matter of fact, they, uh, one day about three years ago, I think it was in April, and uh, they ended up seeing a tornado just northwest of Stillwater. They got pictures of it right from the cellar door, you know, and uh, we didn't see anything that day. So our kids saw a tornado and we didn't. They had a good day. They had a good day. <laughs> yeah. Any of them got the bug? Um, probably. <laughs> we don't. Uh, they. We we don't really take them out on any days that are going to be serious though. Okay. Yeah. Not yet. Well, you mentioned the El Reno was a a major major tornado, and it was another one that same year, wasn't there? Twenty thirteen was also. Yes. Was the, um, the more. The more. Oklahoma City tornado uh, was on May the 20th of 2013. That was an F5. And that, was a, that was a bad one. So we were there for that one also. Uh, so we watched that. Uh, we were down in the southwest part of Oklahoma City and watched it as it approached us. And it passed north of us by about a quarter of a mile or so, knocking power lines down. And, and then we uh, moved from there over to Santa Fe and went north about the time it was going through that area but that school that got hit um, on that one. And so, yeah, it, we followed that tornado. And if you've seen something like that, how do you come down or relax or you know, just? Oh, you know, it's kind of hard because when we get home, you know, you can you lay down and go to sleep and all that's going through your mind, you know, so it takes a while. You got to kind of got to unwind. I guess you could say, but sometimes I'll lay down and I see rotation in my sleep. Maybe you ever talk in your sleep, we gotta go. I, probably. <laughs> Is there an image or two in you, that you just cannot forget? Oh, there's a lot of images that we can, I mean, damage. You know, when you see F5 damage, you know, that's pretty horrific. You see what it does to cars, you know, and you see, I mean, I'm thinking of tornadoes I've seen right now, and. I mean, I can remember, you know, exactly what most of them look like. Some of them, you know, the big ones for sure. Is there a sound or a smell that goes along with, with that sort of? Yeah, um, there's there's definitely a sound, and uh, the sound depends on how big the tornado is and what kind of terrain it's going through. Mm -hmm. So if you have a big tornado going through trees or in a town, it'll be roaring like a jet engine, like a B-52. I mean, that's what it sounds like, just a really loud roar. And you can hear it if you're close enough to it. So smaller tornadoes more, might sound more like a hissing, if they're, especially if they're going across the field or something like that. Can't hear small ones as much as you can hear the big ones though. When they get that big and they start roaring like that, I mean, that's pretty incredible. And smell, I'm imagining dirt, but. Yeah, um, a lot of times, probably the, the most thing you smell when you're following a tornado is vegetation, mm -hmm. cut vegetation. So, I mean, you'll smell, you know, I mean, if you ever went out and cut tree limbs or something like that, it kind of has that smell mm -hmm. to it. And uh, you know, when you smell that smell at night, let's say and you're driving, that there's either been a hailstorm or a tornado. That's the only two it can really come from. Because the hail knocks the, the leaves and stuff off and you can smell sometimes cedar, you know, cut cedar and, and cut trees and stuff like that. You can smell it pretty strong. 
Also, uh, like in big damage areas, we'll smell natural gas a lot of times, and we'll sometimes there'll be fires, you know. You have to be aware of where all the dams and lakes and that sort of thing are too when you're out. Yeah, I mean, if there's flooding, right. I'm just thinking Twister with the, with the twin sisters. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That was over a lake. I think that was over a lake. It was, I believe it was near a lake, yeah, in the movie. But, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll follow it no matter where it goes. If there's a lake there, you know, when you say that, we got to be aware of, um, you know, where stuff like that is because of access to get through on roads. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. I mean, when I'm chasing, uh, and, and we start getting one that starts spinning, a wall clad that looks like it's going to do something, or there's a tornado, um, I'm already planning where we're going to be four or five miles down the road. So I'm looking at the map and I'm planning our future. Aside from looking, trying to figure out what's going on, there's a thousand things going through my mind, but I'm also looking at the map, planning our route based on which way it's going. So your geography comes in handy there. That's where the geography comes in, exactly. <laughs> So did you ever aspire to be a, a meteorologist on, on television? Um, you know, I thought about it, uh, but you know, that's people, there's a big turnaround mm -hmm. in that kind of stuff. It's pretty rare to see someone stay at a station for a long time, you know, um, and besides that storm chasing is a lot more exciting. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> well, back in your classes at OU, were there, was it all men? Were there any females? Oh, there were some. There were some girls, but I would say it's probably seventy percent men. At that point, or still? I, you know, I don't. I, I don't know still, but it, there's probably a few more women today than there was back then. But seventy or eighty percent men back then. You know, I'd say geography majors were probably the same thing. That there was many more men than women. Yeah. Too. Probably. And you still have Gary's book and jacket. When he retired, did you give him an autograph of you? <laughs> <laughs> of you? <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. That was a sad day, I guess, when he retired because you would would work together for so long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and uh, not only that, you know, he had a big following too. Yes. You know, lots of people. But uh, there's only one Gary. And he was in the Twister, wasn't he? Do you have an opinion? In the about Twister that? movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was in it, right. Do you have an opinion about that movie? About the movie? Yeah. You know, it's it's pretty hard. I mean, you want to make it as realistic as possible, but you also want to make it entertaining also. So I thought they did a pretty good job. Some of the tornadoes were a little bit hokey, I guess you could say, but a couple of them looked pretty real too. So I thought they did a pretty good job of making it as realistic as they could. That was about the time I, my dates. Was that before or after you started? That was after. Chasing? That's after I started. Yeah, it's in '95, I think it was. So, a bit after then. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool movie for those. I grew up in Tennessee, North Carolina, so we didn't have as many okay. tornadoes here. Trees were in the way. Too. Mm, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that was a, a movie we saw before we moved here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. The uh, interesting switch when fires and all that too were, yeah. were coming around at, at that time too when we moved. So you've seen a lot. You have seen a lot. Seen a lot. You. How long do you plan to do this? Have you thought about that? As long as God will let me. So okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I I look at it as a calling. You know, more than anything. Because I know that uh, I'm not going to be naive enough to think that I put myself where I'm at. It was God that allowed us, you know, to be where we are. And he's kept us safe over the years, too. But he's also given me a, a public platform in which to tell people about him. Mm -hmm. And so we try to use that. So faith, faith is a, an important part of this? Faith is everything in my life. Yeah. And was it early on? Like you said your parents took you to church, so it started early. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, and probably grew, you know, as the years went on. I mean, uh, probably more so um, maybe a little after I graduated from college, you know. I mean, uh, I, w I would say I wasn't too strong in the faith before then, but uh, about that time, 
you know, maybe a couple years before I met my wife is, uh, is when my faith really grew. Well, I mean, you see nature at work, too, mm -hmm. kind of reinforces some of that, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, even in storms like that, I mean, it's, uh, you see how small man really is and just realize that uh, there's nothing we can do to control the weather. You know, God is in control of all of that. And it's just really sometimes just incredible to see the power that he displays and the beauty, too. And he hasn't told you to leave Oklahoma and go somewhere else? Has not yet. I, you know, I'm, I'm always seeking God's will, trying as best I can anyway. And so, um, you know, if, if God makes it, you know, obvious to me that he wants me to do something else, that's what I'm going to do. Have you had opportunities to, to move bigger markets or that sort of thing? I know you can't get much bigger than Oklahoma for, for storm chasing, but... Well, the thing about it is, is um, Oklahoma City is the biggest storm chasing market there is. I mean, there's other, there's bigger markets, television markets, but they don't chase and, and other. I mean, if you think about it, there's really only this region of the country, say Dallas, Wichita, Amarillo, um, maybe to some extent Little Rock, Tulsa, um, Lubbock. And that's pretty much it. Maybe Springfield, Missouri, um, that would that even has chasers. And Oklahoma City, we have way more than everybody else. And Wichita has some, Amarillo has some, Lubbock has some, and I think Dallas has a little. But you know, Dallas is a much bigger market than Oklahoma City. A much bigger television market. More money, more more viewers all that kind of stuff, but they don't chase near as much as Oklahoma City does. They just don't have the frequency of tornadoes that we have in Oklahoma City. So we're kind of in a unique area. It's a good spot to be if, it you, is. Like, if you like doing this work. If you like it, that's right. Do you go to other places to teach or train, train them? No, um, not so much. I mean, we're on call all the time for weather here. And so we do have to be available. You know, if something happens, like if David calls and says, hey, we got a wildfire and we need you to go. I know there's not going to be a tornado today, you know, just knowing the weather the way it is, but we got to be on the call to be ready. Do you, do you get a, a choice of where you head in the state when a storm, a storm day is coming? Uh, for the most part, I would say. As the uh, senior, you get the first dibs. And, and I like that too, <laughs> you know, um, I pretty much do. Um, Sometimes, you know, if we do have people spread out, sometimes uh, if I might have to, I can't always go where I want to uh, if someone else is already in that spot and there's another storm, maybe a lesser storm, I might have to cover the lesser storm, you know, but that's just part of it. Not necessarily based on your, your core being here in Stillwater, close? No, it's just, not. Just no, because we'll go anywhere. And you get up early to head out if you know it's going to be a storm. Yeah, and generally, I would say generally around noon or so is, is a good average time we head out. Storms don't usually start until at the earliest three or maybe four. So when, when the two of you are in the truck heading toward this, if there's a decision to be made, who makes it? We kind of talk about it, okay. you know, and she puts gives her input and, and I'll you know give my input. And, you know, sometimes I'll say, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, and we'll go there. Or sometimes I'll just do what I want to do and go. <laughs> and that's okay, too. Huh? Yeah. So if you're looking back, was there a, a, a moment or that just stands really stands out on your, in your career so far? Well, probably the May 3rd tornado outbreak of 1999. That was the first F5 that we've seen. That was probably the worst tornado outbreak that, that's happened since we've been chasing. Probably the biggest loss of life of any tornado that we've had. I mean, that was a, uh, that was a, a bad day, uh, but there, were, there was a lot of good warnings that were put out from all the media, not just Channel 9, but all the media and the weather service put out really good warnings that really kept the loss of life a lot lower than it could have been. So, you know, basically, we're trying to save lives, and uh, we're just trying to do what we can. And so, 
you know, we're, we're trying to, uh, you know, people ask, why do you put yourself out there in harm's way? Well, that's pretty much why, is to keep people safe. Well, and like the day after, do you go back and help do anything with? Um, now, sometimes we do. Um, if there's a bad, like the May 13th, we went out and tried to help a little bit in some of those areas that we were chasing in. And then Channel 9 will set up like a, a drop-off point for food and, and stuff like that that people might need. And we'll, pretty much everybody will come up there and help on that. I think it's interesting that your dad was from Moore. Yeah. And these have all happened. I know. In, in Moore or? And we still have some relatives that live in Moore. Some cousins and aunts and uncles. Well, and you choose to live in Stillwater for any particular reason? Um, you know, that's where Amy lived. I was in Norman when we got married and I just decided to move up here because she had a pretty good job up here at the time and and uh, my business was a weather consulting business and I could move it anywhere. So Stillwater is a good town. And, you know, I'd, at, at first, you know, I wasn't sure, but we've really come, you know, to like Stillwater. It's a great town to raise kids in. So uh, this is home. Just thinking to be more centrally located to go all over the state would be probably in Oklahoma City. Probably. To hit the interstates. Yeah. But we can we can reach wherever we need to go pretty quick. Do you ever get a speeding ticket? Um, no comment. <laughs> We're not immune to being stopped. Okay, that's we'll just, good enough then. <laughs> we'll just say that. So perhaps. Most of the time, I'll tell you this though, when we get pulled over, most of the time now, I mean, when they see the markings on the truck, it's like they pull us over to ask what the radar looks like and what we think is going to happen. Where they need, yeah. Where they need to be going the other direction. Yeah, or, yeah. or so that they can, you know, warn people too. Yeah. So, do you work closely with like the city of Moore, the emergency management folks, for any particular reason? Uh, not really. I mean, um, we have enough to do with, you know, getting word back to Channel Line. Do you carry a first aid kit in your truck? Yeah. Yeah. And I figured you might with, even know some e some emergency management type medical stuff to Well, there's of. always more that we can learn, yeah. you know, and it's probably a good idea to learn as much as we can. How to do CPR if you need to. Yeah. On someone. Yeah. You plan to get a well, it's too late, I guess, to do a master's. You don't really need one or a PhD and go into the classroom and teach. I'm not a glutton for punishment. We'll just say that. <laughs> and so of all the people, let's see, we need to talk about the helicopter. Well, no, you probably don't deal with Jim Gardner much. Oh, I listen to him. I mean, yeah. we, we can't really talk back and forth because he's on a different system you know, uh, an IFB system, and we're on the Gettner, all the storm trackers. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we interact, yeah. And then you mentioned there's another couple, married couple. For uh, we have time. we have three married couples, actually, that chase. Hmm. Uh, us, and also Hank and Patty, and also Marty and Debbie, Logan. Okay. Then you guys were the star and said it can be done. Yeah. And you, from what I was reading, you were married the month after the, the May 3rd. Yeah, a month and a half after that. We were married on June the 26th, and that was on May the 3rd. So, yeah, it was a pretty hectic time in our life. I was, and, the, and she was your partner at that point, yes. too. So you were doing that chasing together that day. Exactly. Mm. So how did you pop the question? <laughs> uh, it was on a storm chase, actually. Oh, well, yeah. it might have been, so. Yeah. <laughs> no hesitation, yes, let's do it, huh? No hesitation. I think we, we knew at the time. Okay. And you knew not to have the wedding in April, May, or June? <laughs> April, May? We knew not to have it in May. <laughs> and late June is pretty safe, okay. too. Yeah, I mean, it pretty much ends about mid-June or so. So that went into your thinking for picking a date. Do what? That went into your thinking when you were planning a yeah. wedding day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about when children were born? Well, you know, I don't know if this, this really, we weren't planning it, but it did happen that uh, most of the children were born in summer, midsummer to uh, early fall, okay. midfall. Well, so, I mean, that, that worked out pretty good. 
Yeah, you don't miss too many birthday birthday parties for all right. that event. Exactly. Oh, okay. So in the next five to ten years, what do you what do you see happening? I'm gonna chase as long as I can, you know. Um, we'll just see what happens. But as long as I still have a desire uh, and a passion for chasing, I'm gonna do it. If that leaves me and I decide that I, I don't really want to do it anymore, then I'm not going to do it. And then if any of your children decide they want to follow the path? That's up to them, you know, but I, I'd support it. Yeah. Say, oh, you's down the road. <laughs> you don't have to have a degree in meteorology to chase. But I think it comes in, it it does come come in, in handy, I would think. It does come in handy, that's for sure. I mean, probably two out of our seven have degrees, the other have meteorology degrees, the other ones don't. Well, those who don't, then they depend on you or David Payne or whoever to tell them where they needed to be? Well, I think that they're experienced enough. They've learned, they're very good at it. Okay. And um, they're experienced enough to uh, um, to know what's going on. They can tell if it's going to shift, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you wear uniforms? Different colors? Yeah, we wear, I mean, different things. I mean, you know, we got several different shirts that we can wear when we're going out, but we always have a Channel 9 shirt on when we're going. You don't have to worry about helmets or any other safety precautions? No, I mean, it might be smart to put a helmet on, you know, but that's kind of, we have helmet. I've got a helmet, I've got a hard hat I keep in the truck for hail. If I have to get out, pick up a hailstone or something. So yeah, I put a hard hat on for that. I've been hit a few times, and I don't like it. I guess most of the time you just stay in the truck. Most of the time, yeah, it's safest. Yeah, you do because you can do your videoing and your photography and all that from inside the from truck. inside the truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you got lightning, and lightning's more dangerous, really, than tornadoes. So, because uh, you never know where that's going to strike. So we stay in the truck ninety nine percent of the time. Hope your tires are good. You don't have flats and all that. Do right. You do? It's happened once or twice. Yeah, but it's got to change it. So, how many trucks have you had in those 28, 28 years? <laughs> um, probably about ten. Well, every two years or two to three years. I would say, years. on average, three years or so. Um, well, I guess if you're putting fifty thousand miles on it a year. Yeah, and then you got hail, and yeah. Do you, do you have a good body man, body shop guy that? We don't fix it. We don't fix it. We don't think it's gonna happen again. Okay, just take care of the windshield. Right, we gotta get the windshield fixed. Right, yeah. and I probably go through, on average, maybe two windshields per season. Well, that's not as bad as I thought. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's still a challenge, I guess, too, with the hail. Exactly. So what's the biggest piece you've seen help? Uh, the biggest one that I've actually seen uh, was about the size of a cantaloupe. That's that's a big hail. And is, that would come through your windshield for sure. I think it probably would if it hits you just right, yeah. It might do some damage to you. Yeah, um, that was on the ground that we saw. Um, I mean, we've been hit with some big ones. I don't know how big they were, you know, and some pretty big ones. I mean, I've had... That one I told you about was the biggest hailstorm that we've had that destroyed the truck. Now we had one in April of this year that came close to doing that much. Uh, actually, we had pieces of glass coming in on us that time too, and the windshield had caved in some, but we were able to drive home. It wasn't so fractured and splintered that we couldn't see to drive, but we drove home with it like that. And if you'd had to go back out the next day, what would you? I mean, cause sometimes we did have to go back the next back day. Back. Yeah, but we uh, we have a place in Oklahoma City called Auto Glass Now that uh, we can, I can call them up and they'll get to us in a hurry. So we went down there about ten o'clock in the morning. They got it done. We went back out. Okay, it knows to, it helps to know people then, huh? <laughs> well, we're frequent, basically frequent customers with them. Do you, Do you have a name for your truck? Uh, no. No, you don't know. No. Not a monster truck or depends on what kind of mood I'm in, I guess. <laughs> Stupid truck now. No. Yeah, I mean I don't most people, I mean if it's if it's acting up, it's a stupid truck. <laughs> <laughs> if it's doing fine, it's a good truck. 
Uh, you get it serviced and ready to go before the season starts. Yeah. As best we can, yeah. yeah. And how do you keep up with with, uh, with technology and new things? Do you attend conferences or? Oh, you, you know, we what? just keep ourselves updated on what's new. And Channel Nine helps us out with that. You know, yeah. also will help us. And they pretty much buy all the equipment we have that's in the truck. Do you have a favorite, like the mapping system you were talking about? Favorite GPS program or whatever? Yeah, that you use? I use one called Delorme. Um, Street Atlas, DeLorme Street Atlas USA. Now they've discontinued using that several years ago, but uh, we still use it because I like it the best out of all of them. Nice big map and a big screen and so it's on a computer and it's done with GPS and it doesn't use cell phone. You don't have to be connected on any cell phone. It's just straight GPS. And so we have to, to use a little bit older operating system. I believe, um, XP, Windows XP still to use that, but uh, we still like it and we still use it. That's that's what we use. Ever come to a road that's, the map says it's there, but it's not? And sometimes, yeah. Yeah, it just, they change roads sometimes too. So we get on that. But it's pretty accurate for the most part. And you take a lot of pictures? Um, as many as we can, we can. I mean, most of it's video with our camera. But uh, we're getting now where we we start taking pictures with our phone, also. I was gonna say, do you have a favorite, a couple of favorite photographs on your walls at home? We do, actually. Yeah. I thought yeah. you might. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Some spectacular ones, I would imagine. Pretty good ones, yeah. yeah. Got one that's a, a nighttime tornado of uh, Pampa, Texas. It happened in, in November, about three or four years ago, and. Um, it's illuminated by a power flash. So there was a, it hit something and a power flash lit up the whole tornado. It's a really cool picture of a pretty good sized tornado at night. Um, so we also have, there's, there's several other ones that, you know, that we have. There's a lot of pretty good photos that we have. You've had to learn a lot of this as you, as you went along too. I mean, yeah, it's not just something that you learned here at OSU or, or OU. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that they don't teach in school. I mean, there's no curriculum on storm chasing, really. You know, it's pretty much you got to learn it. Well, advice for someone who's interested in getting into it? Um, it always helps to go get a degree in meteorology. I mean, that's, I would recommend that first. Um, second thing is, is don't start on your own chasing without knowing what you're doing. And, you know, you go with someone that's more experienced and knows what they're doing first until you learn it. And the third thing is, is stay behind the tornado. Never get out in front of it in case, you know, you make a mistake or the road runs out or your car dies, you don't want it to come over you. So stay behind it if you're learning. And the closest call you've come? <sighs> um, we've been actually hit by several small tornadoes. Um, the last one for it to happen uh, was in the Texas Panhandle. We were chasing a bigger tornado. And actually, uh, the bigger tornado was coming at us, and we were trying to get just south of it. And so we were going south down a road, and it was coming at us from the southwest, and we were trying to beat it. Okay, and it was going to be a close call, but we did beat it by about three or four hundred yards. All right, but. After we got past it, there was what we call a satellite tornado. Sometimes you get a small little satellite tornado that will form on the periphery of some of the bigger ones. And it formed right in front of us as we were driving 70 miles an hour down this road. It was about as wide as the ditches, right? And it just formed in front of us. No time to react. We just had to drive through it. And it uh, just held on real tight. I'm thinking, oh, what's going to happen? So, I mean, we got kind of pushed left. Pushed right, and then we were out of it. Just like that. I could hear rocks and stuff, you know, hitting the sides of the truck. But uh, that's what happened. And luckily, it wasn't very strong. Or long, if it did take you long to do. Well, it's about did. as wide as the ditches or the fences. That's about as wide as it was. You're pretty good with uncertainty then. Some, yeah, there's a lot. In storm chasing, there's really never anything planned. You know, your route is never planned. 
I mean, it's it's always uh, you got to make quick decisions, and you know, it, it's on a whim pretty much. I'm thinking characteristics of a good storm chaser. You'd have to be okay with unpredictability. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Because there's there's no set routes or planned routes or anything planned. I mean, we never really know exactly where we're going to go when we're out. You know, we can we can set a, an area that we're going to, but then after that, who knows where we might end up. And you got to make decisions quickly. Some of those might even be life and death decisions. You know, quick decisions and act on them and just go with it. So it's a lot of spur of the moment stuff. Trust your gut or instincts. Yeah. And then you don't know when you're going to get back home then if you don't know, you don't know. where you're going. You don't know where you're going. But that's I right. uncertainty, yeah. That's right. Well, we've covered a lot. Is there anything that we need to cover that I haven't, didn't know to ask or haven't asked? I don't think so. I think you're pretty thorough. I think you just well, pretty much got everything. Well, I was reading that you guys have recorded over 300 tornadoes. That's old. I mean, it's probably somewhere between 600 and 1,000. Wow. Yeah. That is quite old then. Oh. Let me see if there's anything else. What do you do for downtime? Uh, take care of kids. Uh, do do ministry-related stuff at church. Want to hunt or? You know, I used to hunt. Play golf? <laughs> I don't have time for golf anymore. And used to do a lot of hunting. But now I guess we just hunt bigger game. <laughs> and are there ever traffic jams with too many too many people trying to get to the? That's getting to be more of a problem these days. Do they do they give you the? Not necessarily. No. Not as the senior. senior. No, I mean, we, sometimes there's as many as three hundred chasers out there on one storm. Wow. And we just when that when we see that, we will just take dirt roads. And just avoid the crowds and stay on dirt roads and stuff. And try to get to the spot before yeah. you know, the other one. Okay. Yeah. The May third one was the Bridge Bridge Creek in the Moore. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then El Reno. El Reno said two, like the twenty twenty eleven and then twenty thirteen. Yes, and we were we chased both of those too. <clears throat> And double vortexes? Yeah, we see those. Um, we call them multiple vortex tornadoes. Sometimes you'll see, and that was in the arena one that was going on in arena. Sometimes the bigger tornadoes have several what we call sub vortices spinning around the central spot, basically. Um, some of the, the big mile wide tornadoes you see. You know, it's so dusty and dirty on the outside, you can't see what's going on, but there will be sub vortices almost invariably in every one of those spinning around. So the Arena ones is pretty crazy because each one of those little small tornadoes going around the big circulation uh, was, was probably moving its forward speed at over 100 miles an hour, each one of them, aside from the rotation and the wind speed they had. In that so that's pretty crazy yeah. you need to be good at science and physics yeah and, and even still it's hard to really model all of that too you know it's hard to measure it do you want to say anything about your company yeah guess caster weather yeah Inc., right it's weather consulting company and you know I've done uh, things in the past I've done uh, law cases involving the weather we call that forensic meteorology um, that kind of stuff, um, you know, some forecasting, and um, so basically, you know, that's that's what I do in that. Right now, we're starting to do more in the way of uh, we're getting more sponsors, sponsorships for storm chasing, people advertising on my truck, advertising on Facebook, and stuff like that. So that's pretty much taken over. Pretty cool. Yeah. Too. Getting support there. Yeah. Do you have an opinion about? That? Should, should storm chasers be, or trackers, whichever one want to eat, be licensed? Um, you know, <clears throat> there's different thoughts about that that people have. Um, you know, if I wasn't 
a media chaser, I would say, no, we don't need to have a license. I would say, I'd be against it for sure. You know, because if we're a free country and people ought to be able to go out and do what they want, chase the storm if they want to, you know. But um, so, I mean, I would, in general, I'd probably say no. It, it might be nice to have some sort of regulation, but uh, I'd probably say no. Yeah, I, I wouldn't require that. And then having your brother in the same business, too, are you too competitive a little bit? Oh, could be a little who, bit. Who's, who's got the best? Yeah. But you're pretty much on the same team, you mm. know. But if we're competitive, it's in a friendly sort of way. And we're, we're also pretty competitive with the other stations, too, and the other storm chasers. But we still know them, too. Well, and early on, I was reading that there were some issues with the competition, I guess it would be better, between... News Nine and the National Weather Service calling shots. The news news calling it before the weather National Weather did. I mean, there's been issues in the past, but um, I mean, I think that they're their own entity, and we're our we have our purpose. They have their purpose, you know, and we ought to be working on the same team. I would think. And the Doppler Doppler radar has been a very big big deal through the. Through the years too. Oh yeah, Doppler radar is very big. I mean, that's that that was the, one of those breakthroughs basically when they got the Doppler radar. So we rely on that. And really, what what uh, you know, you could say how technology changes now. After they developed the Doppler radar, it's software that reads the radar that gets better. So the software can actually you know tell more and more and more these days as the more they develop it about what's going on. Know, with that and they still need you guys to be able to see what's happening actually exactly. on, on the ground they're always going to need the spotter because if you think about the radar uh, the radar beam depending on how far away the storm is from the radar you have the curvature of the earth and so the radar beam pretty much goes straight and so it's going to hit the storm at a level up above right so the radar is sampling the storm could be 10,000 feet above the ground. So you're going to need spotters to tell you what's going on at the base of the cloud or what's going on in the ground because radar can't definitely tell you there's a tornado on the ground unless the radar is right next to the tornado. Then it can. And then what did your, your grandparents think about what you and your brother do? <laughs> um, you know, I. I, I I think they were a little bit apprehensive, you know, about it, but, you know, it depends on if you talk to my, my grandma or my grandpa, you know, he thought it was pretty cool, and she was like, you better be careful. Yeah, and they were quite proud of you, I guess, too. Everybody sure. knows who Val is these days. Well, <laughs> you know, like I say, it's only by the grace of God. Okay. Then my last question will be, how do you want people to remember Val? When history's written about you, what do you want it to say? I want it, I'd like it to say that, uh, that he was a man of God. Okay. Well, I think that's a good way to end it. Thank you okay. for coming and sharing. It's been great. Well, you're welcome. Okay. Enjoyed it.